question is really about public sentiment and current public policy. Currently, we have 37 states and the District of Columbia that allow for medical marijuana use. And uh, in 2019, there was a poll by Marquette University Law School that found that 83% um, of citizens in Wisconsin support the legalization of medical marijuana in Wisconsin. In the last two years, we have had several polls, and they have indicated that uh, the support for legalization of uh, recreational marijuana is somewhere between 60 to one to 69 percent. So roughly two thirds of Wisconsinites uh, even support legalization of marijuana for uh, recreational purposes. So with that being said, why do you think, and this is for both of you, why do you think there is a discrepancy clearly between public sentiment and current public policy here in Wisconsin? Sure. Okay, I'll start out with that. And I just want to say thank you for hosting this and for everyone that's here tonight. So when I talk to my colleagues in, in, the, in the Capitol, a lot of it is, you know, we still have medical professionals who aren't there. We still have law enforcement who's not there around full recreational. Um, and that's, that's why I've decided to focus on, you know, just legalizing the medical. <coughs> It t sometimes, you know, government works slow at times, and it, it, public pressure will continue to get us there. I know I've had conversations over the years with law enforcement. They said, well, if we could test for it, and what should that limit be? You know, you can do a breathalyzer to see if somebody has an impairment around alcohol, and we prohibit alcohol in the workplace. The employer community is a little bit afraid of marijuana because of the residual effects or what could happen, construction zone, driving CDLs, um, you know, manufacturing and what's their liability going to be. So I think there's just been a lot of caution on that. And yet we also see, like I've talked to a lot of people in the last six years, because this is going to be my third time introducing the bill. So it, we talk about a session, and a session is two years. Um, so this will be going into the third session or the six years that I've been working on it. But even a lot of our medical professionals will say, you know, there is medical uses for marijuana, but marijuana also has a large detriment on the development of the front lobe, front lobe of the brain in young adults. So there's still a lot of caution um, if this should be fully legalized. And I think that's why that it hasn't come as fast as maybe public sentiment around it. So it really comes down to a disconnect between politicians in Madison and the, and the public. Um, since I've been doing this, the public has generally supported the issue on medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, like everybody said. Um, it, the, the polling that comes out each and every year just shows more support for it. So it's it's just politics at this point. Like I said, the, the wheels of government are slow. Um, on the advocate side of it, I personally feel that since Wisconsin hasn't gone legal, the industry and the people who really love cannabis have left Wisconsin and put their endeavors into other states, and that means money in other states. And right now, it doesn't look like Wisconsin is gonna happen, so the people who have money to put into lobbying efforts are just not spending it in Wisconsin, so that kind of hampers and slows down the, the overall process also. <coughs> Well, um, I wanted to ask more about the Senator's proposal, um, the, the framework for creating medical, uh, medical marijuana here in Wisconsin. I know that uh, it would create a medical marijuana um, regulatory commission housed under the Department of Revenue. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit more on this framework uh, and you know how strict could we expect um, actual legislation to be when it comes to legalizing? legalizing medical marijuana. So I'll give you a little history about the development of the bill. So six years ago, four years ago now it would be, when we first started working on the bill, I was in the assembly. And what we did over the summer before um, the fall session started, before the election, we worked with a lot of the different groups around the state. And 
the state of Wisconsin has agencies. So the legislature has agencies that work for us. Um, there's Ledge Council, there's Ledge Reference Bureau, and then there's LFB, which is Ledge Fiscal Bureau. So these agencies are stacked with attorneys and people that know how to write legislation, do research, and everything. We, we do not do that on our own. So what we asked them to do was take five states, and at the time when we started working on this, Wisconsin was a complete red state. We had a Republican governor, and the Republicans controlled, controlled the legislature. So the thought process was that if we're gonna pass this through a completely red state, we needed to work under the parameters of what other red states have done. So we took five states, and we worked off of their framework to build something that we felt maybe could pass in the state of Wisconsin. We then sat down with, um, my assembly colleagues, and we had like little mini focus groups, and we'd say to them, all right, what could you live with inside this bill, and what is an absolute non-starter for you? Um, and, and that's where this framework came. So how it's set up is who can prescribe it? Physicians, physicians assistants, and certified and advanced nurse, pra nurse practitioners. And I will tell you that we're unique compared to other states because most of the other states only allow physicians to prescribe. And I, I'm gonna use the term prescribed, but I should use the term recommendation because it's not a legal drug. What can they recommend? Um, they can receive medical marijuana if they are with a, a provider that is licensed to recommend, and then if they have a qualifying medical condition and a medical marijuana card. There will be dispensaries, and there will be a limited number of dispensaries based on the population size in your county. And this would go into effect there's gotta be rulemaking authority and things, so it's probably when the bill passes, it would be up to 180 days or 360 days past the time of the bill passing. In addition to that, the qualifying medical conditions is also a really tough thing. Um, we looked at other states and what they allow. How it is ingested is another thing. Um, we just met yesterday with the Assembly and the Senate and with Ledge Council and stuff because we've had a couple of um, outside groups, and I would, this is where I would disagree. Actually, the lobby, the big corporations are hiring lobbyists left and right in Madison, so they very much feel this is coming and everybody wants to be involved and have a seat at the table. Um, the qualifying medical conditions, we're expanding on that. Right now, it's oils, tinctures, patches, pills, and we're looking at adding vape, vaporization and nebulization to that. I know that when I've talked to our veterans communities, they very much want the smoking, but our colleagues are not open to the smoking part of it because of the secondhand smoke and children can be in the household. Um, the qualifying medical conditions we're expanding on, and then we give the commission the ability to add conditions on that with the advice of the medical examining board. One of the things that we really wanted to do was take the legislature out of this and give it to a commission so it doesn't get to be a political football. We allow growing, we have licenses for growing, processing, um, laboratories, and transporting. The lab, if you have uh, financial interest in the growing, processing, um, you cannot have a financial interest in a laboratory. We want to keep the laboratories completely independent on that. And we learned a lot when we did the CBD bill on, on how to set up these laboratories and some of the other regulation. Um, the other thing is a taxation of it. So there's gonna be licenses and fees for um, the processors and to apply. And then we're gonna put a 10% 10 10 excise tax on this at the wholesale level. And that is the only way that we're going to tax it. When I've, I've worked with a lot of other states, I, I go to a lot of national conventions where there's Lot, or, um, legislators from the other parts of the state, they said do not, whether it's medical or full recreational, do not overprice the product and do not sell this with its, all this revenue to the state. Because then what you do is you overprice it and all you do is create a black market. We're trying to get away from the black market because of the influence of fentanyl and some of the drugs that, that we're seeing and, and that's something we're trying to get away from. Also as proposing it for medical, we're doing this to help people, not make money. You know, I see a lot of people that use it now and it's helped them, whether it's MS, irritable bowel, sinister cancer, you name it. This is not about the state making money on it. This is about just bringing in enough money to actually um, pay for the program and the administration on it, not to put money in the coffers. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for those uh, details about the program. 
what I'm interested in is like where does this bill stand? Uh, if we look at some of the media coverage, it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we had Senate Majority Leader uh, Evan uh, LeMahieu, who kind of talked about uh, uh, medical marijuana, and he said, we're pretty close as a caucus to support medical marijuana. Then a few weeks later, so just a few weeks ago, we had Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, who said, we're not that close in a, in a TV interview on the, on, on the legalization aspect. So um, obviously there are a lot of discussions going on right now, but what do you see as the key hurdles and where do you see your your caucus at this point? So I just met with Speaker Voss this morning on some of these issues. So um, Speaker Voss was bound and determined to have the dispensaries owned and operated by the state. And his reasoning for doing that was trying to take some of the financial incentive out of marijuana and cannabis and he wants to slow down Wisconsin's going to get to full recreational at some point. You can never tie the hands of future legislators, and at some point we're, we'll be there. What that time frame is, I don't have the answer to. So I know, I think Robin has kind of put the brakes on it to kind of just slow the process down and think through what we're doing. He did form a committee, um, Representative Snyder, who is the bill author in the assembly, Representative Moses, who is the health chair, and then Representative Rosar, uh, who is a vice chair of health, are the three that are working on it to kind of bring things forward. We met with them yesterday um, because we were told to take a look at Ohio and Pennsylvania, that some of the things that they have done have some really good ideas in it. So we are tweaking the bill that we have and bringing in some of those ideas from Ohio and Pennsylvania. I would guess that we will have legislation in the next month and a half, two months. Things are going a little bit slower on the legislation side right now because we are actively working on the budget. Wisconsin does a biennial budget and that's consuming a lot of what we do and we have to have that done and in place by the end of June statutorily. Um, I would say that the bill will probably get introduced this spring yet and then our goal is to build momentum over the summer and hopefully have a hearing in early fall um, in both houses and then Hopefully we can get it across the finish line this fall or early January. I don't want it to time out without this bill having a hearing. So our goal is to get it done yet. Mm -hmm. Before we go into the uh, world of recreational marijuana, just one more question about medical marijuana. And I don't know if you both can sort of weigh in, but if you're looking at just sort of one counter argument uh, that has to do with more the medical effects, uh, some people have argued that uh, even if you approve it for medical uh, purposes, that uh, medical marijuana can negatively affect your short-term memory, uh, possibly kind of impair your cognitive abilities, and it can damage your lung tissue uh, and could increase the risk of lung cancer, uh, or even uh, open up the, the risk of abuse and addiction. So when you hear those criticisms, how do you, how do you respond? Do you think they are fair or, and well-founded, or whether unfounded. So the smoking of cannabis, uh, although you have uh, you know, hot plant material that you've put into your lungs, if it was clearly cancer causing or some sort of public epidemic, because marijuana is the largest illicit and now non-illicit in some states, but it's the, it's the largest used substance out there. So the, we would have proof that marijuana smoke caused lung cancer. Um, the science just isn't there on that. So uh, most of our prescription meds do have a tendency for abuse, so that's already there in the medical world. And the side effects from a lot of our traditional med medicines are not favorable or not good. Um, so the side effects from marijuana would be less. In the science term, they sometimes refer to that as like harm reduction, that you're using one substance versus another. So we are not going to allow the smoking of it in this bill. Um, that was something that was a non-starter to get through our caucuses. So the issue with the lungs and the lung cancer, I, I think that would be taken off the table. They do talk about development in the front bowl on younger people. And I guess, you know, some of the, the, the conditions that are going to be, and the people that are going to be 
utilizing medical cannabis, I think a little memory loss is the worst of their, I mean, that's the least of their worries because they're dealing with very chronic and um, um, hard to treat conditions. And you know, how did I even get down this path? So in 2014, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer for the second time, and it was a rough battle. Um, and I asked my oncologist, just to give you, by the time I went through all the chemo, and by the time I went through surgeries and radiation, I had left over 600 opioid pills from all the prescription drugs, because I lived on opioids. The side effects, the mental anxiety, all the conditions that come with that, if there's a natural product out there, no offense, but who is government to tell you that you cannot utilize that? That just puts me over the edge. So my libertarian street. We have a very good friend who was diagnosed with MS in her 40s. Um, she's a tall lady, a hobby farmer, worked in manufacturing. Within 36 months, she's in a wheelchair and she's a shadow of herself. The side effects of the drugs, she had no quality of life. I mean, she's just rock bottom. Her husband, and this is six, eight years ago, went out and said, you know what, I don't care, they can put me in jail. She's not back to work, but she's out of the wheelchair, she has quality life, she's got her garden again, she's helping on the hobby farm, and she can actually spend time with her grandkids because they're using cannabis instead of a lot of the drugs. She's off a lot of the drugs. I just think it's cruelty to not allow people to use those. So I, I do believe that the momentum has built um, and I had mentioned this to you a little bit. I am seeing a change in the legislature. We just licensed nat naturopathic doctors. We hear more about natural products and people not wanting conventional drugs. They want to prevent whatever the ailments are or, or not just treat the symptoms of them with conventional medication. They want to get to the root cause of it and do more of a preventive. And so the holistic approach, and I think that's where cannabis is falling right into it, and the, the idea of cannabis is more acceptable. Yeah, I now want to switch a little bit to the world of uh, recreational marijuana. And look at our audience, I see quite a few younger people with, uh, I, I think, hopefully few medical issues. So they might be interested in the recreational side of the, of, of the issue. So, but if we're looking at some arguments here, some people argue that the uh, costs for society are fairly high if you were to legalize it on the, on the recreational side of things. So when you look at the cost for society, we can definitely point uh, possibly at medical, uh, medi costs for medical care, including paying for uh, increased emergency room visits, uh, uh, addiction treatment for the uninsured, more victims of drug driving accidents, uh, possibly more workplace accidents. And overall, people are, some people argue that it just you know, would be just one more harmful substance uh, that doesn't do much good uh, overall for society. So, how do you how do you view the legalization of uh, recreational marijuana, and uh, um, how would you respond to these criticisms? Uh, so, the costs of society are definitely something to weigh into consideration after legalization and before legalization. Um, before legalization, we have people who are charged with crimes that may affect their housing, their job, those types of things. The prohibition or non-legalization of marijuana does not actually stop people from using it also. So we do have a, a tradition, we don't really call it the black market in Wisconsin, it's the traditional market, because that's what has served Wisconsin before legalization. It probably will continue to serve Wisconsin after legalization also. So people have been smoking marijuana since prehistory, since antiquity, and again, go back to that harm reduction that if we look at some of the costs to society, are, they're gonna change too once legalization happens. For example, um, right now, Wisconsin is being forced to drink, you know? Like, I mean, not that, you know, they're pouring it down our throats, but we don't have a safer alternative. If we were presented with a safer alternative, such as cannabis, we might see a reduction in drunk driving and people just drinking and overall addiction of other substances also. Um, so. Again, it's not a simple formula where you can just plug a couple numbers into the situation and it's black and white. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be taken into consideration. But when we start talking about common sense, 
we can definitely look and see that the, the pros of legalization would outweigh the cons almost every day of the, of the week. So I, I agree that the pros and cons and the societal effects really have to be taken into account. And I think one of the things that has happened, there's two, way, two ways that legalization has happened in the United States. One is where the state legislature actually passes the legislation they develop a regulatory framework, and they develop uh, a system of how marijuana will uh, be grown, processed, and distributed. That's one way, and I think that's the smart way. The other way is through a ballot initiative. Um, a lot of the states that have full legalization did it on a ballot initiative. Wisconsin does not have that, but basically what they do is they put a referendum <coughs> out there. If the popular vote passes, it's illegal on, on Tuesday when you go into the polling place and at 8.05 at night when they tally the votes, it's legal. There's no regulatory framework. There's no, the state is thrown into chaos. And those are the states where you've had the stories about full legalization and what a nightmare it's been for the state, how bad things have gone, the police don't know how to handle, nobody's had time to prepare for it. And that's where you get a large influx. And those are usually the states then that tax it to the point where they create the black market, and now they have a ton of issues with it. I would also say some of the first states that legalized it, whether it's Washington, Colorado, Colorado, the nightmare stories have come out of it. And that's what a lot of the legislators, and that's what a lot of people that are anti-full recreational are hanging their hat on. Because there has been a lot of bad things that have happened until you know, things have gotten settled down where here's where it's grown, here's where it's processed. We have seed to sale tracking, and, and we also put it so that um, our prescription drug management program where we track opioid prescriptions, if you have a medical marijuana registration, that will also be on there so a doctor can see that you're taking medical marijuana and how, and then would know how that would interact with any other drugs that you have. So there are safe ways to do it and slowly roll this out and let a state become prepared, let law enforcement become prepared, let society become prepared for it. The problem is that the states that didn't, that didn't do that have created a lot of bad stories and I think those are what people hang their hat on when they're anti-legalization instead of looking at the states that have rolled it out correctly and now have a functioning I have friends that live in Illinois and he's a small business owner and it's like, he doesn't, it's, it's not an issue. Um, I have friends that out in Colorado when they first legalized it, it was a nightmare for employers and a lot of other people. So it's just how it's done and, the, and, and how we as a state approach it. And I don't know if my numbers are, cor uh, are correct, I hope they are. If not, I'm sure Jay will give me the, the updated numbers, but if what I'm looking at is, uh, we have currently 37 states uh, and D.C. Um, who have allowed for medical marijuana use, and we have 21 states, 22, 22 states now, and uh, the District of Columbia who have legalized adult recreational marijuana use. And uh, are there any other uh, there's, states? Yeah, there's 15 states that have legislation. There's 15 states that have legislation um, either active right now concerning outright adult use. Another kind of politically correct term that we try to use rather than use is rather than recreational, we use the term adult use now. So it's just, if you can continue to use that also, I would appreciate it. Um, because it does really show responsible use. I mean, there's responsible adult use, which is what we're talking about, where it's, you know, recreational gives it a, a I don't want to say a negative, but it, it, it gives a thought process right away. So um, so 15 states, and then there's one that has a ballot initiative, like you had mentioned. Oklahoma is coming up on Tuesday for a vote. So if you ask me this question next Wednesday, we might be saying 23. Um, I'm going to comment just a little bit about the ballot initiative. I worked in Michigan, uh, which both went medical and recreational under a ballot initiative. And I don't see the same things that you have mentioned, including the high taxation. Michigan has one of the lowest taxations on the rate, uh, on a, a rate on any state out there. The other thing with our ballot initiatives is even though, like I said, the law changed the next day, 
what it did is it removed people off the battlefield of this war on drugs. It basically allowed cops not to prosecute people anymore. But on our recreational end, it was like two years before regulations finally spilled out and we had stores open. What the ballot initiative did was really force the legislators to create the framework to regulate marijuana like alcohol, which took a considerable amount of time. I have perhaps two more questions and then we can open up to the questions from the audience. But since you both already touched on this question of uh, what about uh, having a black market, uh, especially for uh, adult use marijuana? So um, some people you know, are concerned that you know, creating a commercialized uh, legal market opens up the door, obviously, also especially for an illegal market where they may um, undercut their prices uh, to these state licensed sellers. So how can, how can those concerns be alleviated? And what are our experiences from states who have uh, legalized it for adult use purposes. Uh, okay, so um, it really comes down to design of regulation. That if you're designing a program that's going to be very exclusive, especially under the medical end, limiting qualifying conditions, that's that's going to have an impact on the traditional market without legalization. And why is that? It's because people are going to be more exposed to it. We're going to see commercials, seminars, TVs. Medical marijuana is going to become very popular under any type of program that is passed. What's going to happen is when people don't have the products that they want uh, or the product price point is too high, that's where they turn to the traditional market. So we have to be careful, A, not to tax things too high, not to create a regulatory body that excludes people. Under the medical guys or the medical um, program that might be a little bit more difficult when we talk about recreational marijuana, I think that type of task to eliminate the traditional market or bring as much of the traditional market aboard is much easily, it, it's, it's gonna be easier to do. And you're gonna have to do that through a concept of regulating cannabis like tomatoes. You know, if somebody wants to grow tomatoes in their backyard and share them with their friends, that should be allowed. If somebody wants to grow tomatoes and sell a few tomatoes at the farmer's market, that should be allowed. If somebody wants to grow thousands of acres of cannabis and process them into distillate and make vape cartridges, that should be allowed. There needs to be some sort of regulatory framework to bring all those people into the table. And that's the only way you're going to eliminate the traditional market. I agree that you know how we regulate is going to be the big thing. Um, I, I know as I've talked to people that are traveling into Michigan on a regular basis, and it, it's not just the young people. It's it's my um, 60s. Well, I'm going to be 60 this year, so it's people my age and up that were maybe a little freer back in the 60s. Um, they're enjoying it greatly, but they also want to know that it's they want to know the content and they want to know it's safe. Um, because of the fentanyl issue that we're seeing and what's coming across the border, and and that's what that's where a lot of our problems are at. I just don't. I I just think it all goes back to: is it an affordable product, and is it regulated? I know what I'm buying, but there are going to be people just like I. There's a lot of guys that brew beer in their home and they do moonshot, whatever, that are going to want to grow their own, and I'm fine with that. I personally would be fine with that under a regular recreational or adult use. I'm going to get that down, Jay, I promise. Don't <laughs> smart it. All right, let me ask at least one more question. This, as far as I understand, current laws in Michigan allow uh, for up to 12 plants to be grown on a premise. Uh, and uh, a legalization measure proposed by Wisconsin State Senator Melissa Eggert uh, included or includes this provision of marijuana homegrown in the state. And I think in the last budget provision by Governor Evers, uh, it would allow for a state resident to grow up to six plants uh, in in their home. So there has been some some discussion and some proposals and some. I'm just wondering if if you could talk just a little bit about the the pros and cons of home growing, and whether there should be a, a, a feature to be considered here in Wisconsin. I think I touched on that in my previous question. That obviously, yes, I do believe it needs to be allowed, especially under an adult use program. What that's also going to do is it's going to keep corporate cannabis in check. 
So if people can are not happy with what corporate cannabis is providing them as far as a product or a price point, they have the alternative to grow theirs at home. And that will make uh, the corporate cannabis accountable for the product that they're having out there. Um, the plant count gets a little tricky. Um, everybody has a label or a, you know, a, a formula where they come up with that. The, the more sophisticated states, especially under regulation, um, they really talk about like square footage allowed to grow your cannabis in, and they talk about canopy height. So to make a long story short, you can grow 12 plants or six plants, there's no guarantee, and a grower or a grower style may have a larger yield off six plants than 12 plants, so this you know, limiting a number of plants or creating the maximum number of plants is really, it's, it's, it's uh, a bargaining chip used in the regulatory process in order to pass legislation. When rubber hits the road and it comes down to it, you know, especially like in Michigan, anybody 21 years or older can have 12 plants in their possession in their house. It would be impossible for any sort of regulatory agency to go and check every single household every single week to see how many plants that they would have. So, again, I understand that there has to be some sort of compromise in regulatory bodies in order to make stuff happen. But the difference between six plants and 12 plants is really nothing in the mind of a personal grower. If you just label it one plant, the person who wants to grow marijuana at home is going to find a way to make their system work with one plant versus six plants versus 12 plants. So I, I recreational is not on the table in Wisconsin. I don't disagree with anything that said, but under the medical aspect, when we talked about this and the other states, um, the ones that we are pattering after, it is a controlled growing where it was grown indoors, and then the processing and the labeling, it all has to get the THC limits. So our bill does not allow grow your own. When we talked to our colleagues in the legislature, that was a not, I should say in our caucuses, that was a non-starter for people. Is it more because of the smoking or the diversion, diversion possibility? I think it's because of the, it, I think it's about the smoking end. So the one thing that I've learned and I've ran for office in the past also, um, is I've learned that education is, is really the key. It's education is key in the legislation process, but also education is key in the public process. So if, to me, I would think it would make more sense to you know, allow those types of products, but use funding in order to create some sort of education campaign especially directed at patients, that if you are using your marijuana and you are smoking it or using a floral product, or combustible, you know, not to do that in front of your children or in your house and those types of things. Um, just ignoring it and saying it's you can't do it isn't really gonna help the education process and people are still gonna do it. And even if we have a program that's qualified in Wisconsin and people have these products available to them, but the states around us have smoking products and Again, what's going to stop a patient from going to another state, bringing the smokable product home, and still using that in, in front of their children? So you know, that's, that's where I would take it, is spend money on education, make it a public education awareness, and you will be better off in the long run. All right, uh, thank you to both of you. I have some more questions, but uh, it's certainly time now to get to the audience questions. So uh, yeah, if you, it's, it's open enough for everyone to, um, to uh, ask questions or make comments, uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, you mentioned that with open ballot initiate, initiation or initiates, whatever, um, that it, did that make it, the law pass faster in those states? Like, do you think that, like, what's holding up Wisconsin is the fact they don't have that option? Yeah, the initiatives directly changed the law. So in the states that have ballot initiatives, you're able to collect a certain amount of signatures, you're able to get it on a ballot, and the voters will vote on it. And if they vote yes on it, um, definitely it speeds up the process. Every ballot initiative throughout the United States is worded a little bit differently. So depending on the goal of the ballot initiative, like the Senator had said, some of those were night and day, it changed the next day. 
and the same thing happened in Michigan, some aspects of the law change went in immediately, and some aspects took a while because they needed to have a regulatory framework put out, so. Um, if I can just, uh, I kind of meant like the policies themselves. You mentioned that the lawmaking process and like uh, the regulatory process, uh, it's taken six years at least in Wisconsin with your bill. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, does that regulatory process kick in faster in these states that open ballot? Yeah, because they put a time limit on it. Basically said, it passes today, you got six months to create the regulatory body, and then it needs to be done by then, so. So what the ballot initiative does is it changes law. Where in the state of Wisconsin, the legislature has to write the law, the governor pass it in both houses, and then the governor has to sign it. So but the ballot initiative changed the laws, and then the legislature is trying to catch up and get the regulatory framework in. So when we pass a law in the state of Wisconsin, we then grant agencies rulemaking authority, and then the rules process kicks in, which is which is very cumbersome, but it allows for a lot of public input on how those rules are set up. So the ballot initiative changes the law, and then the rulemaking authority comes into play, where the way was the majority of states that do not have ballot initiatives, we pass the laws, governor signs it, and then the process starts. So it's like, who's changing the law? Ballot initiatives, the citizens are changing the law, no ballot initiative, your elected officials are changing the law. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Other questions? Gary. I actually am a child of the 1960s. And so I'm wondering, um, what are you going to say to those people who we, we just had this gradual or even not gradual loss of discipline? As a nation, we have trillions and trillions of dollars worth of debt. Nobody seems to really care all that much. Now we, we say, just go ahead and have sex, and if you get caught, you'll have an abortion, no problem. Now it's like, don't worry, do do. How would, how would, how do you respond to that kind of so general I, decline? So, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not, let me. I'll give you my two cents about it. Is that any government program that doesn't seem to be working or isn't public supported needs to be examined under the microscope? And that will talk about your going to your trillion dollar debt question that you have out there. So the way I see it is the public doesn't support marijuana prohibition. The goal of prohibition of marijuana has not been met. The benchmarks that we would use as any rational person to say that this is working is not working. We are spending an unforeseen amount of money on it. The adverse consequences of prohibition on our general public are not friendly and it needs to be examined just like any other government program that has failed under a microscope. I would just add to that, you, a lot of the, the spending levels and um, you know what you're saying about you know discipline, all these other things, there's a whole other conversation on that. Um, and I agree with you, I don't think we should be spending where we're at and I, there's a lot of issues that I think you and I would agree on. But I look at what happened in the you know, 20s under Prohibition, when we said alcohol is now illegal and you can't have it. We developed, um, just think of the, the crimes that were developed and the mafia and all the other things that came along with that, and it doesn't work. I think the biggest thing that happened in the 50s is when they made marijuana a Schedule One drug. They put it right up there with cocaine and other things. It is not, and it should have never been a Schedule One drug. And if you want to do some deep dive into research about why marijuana was done that and the Jim Crow, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of conversation we could have about why it was ever put there. President Biden, um, not that I agree with him on much, but he did say that he wanted it removed as a Schedule One drug. And I really wish he would, because the biggest thing is, is our universities and our scientists are very limited on the amount of research that can be conducted on this, like grants to the university and different things. Some of the states, as they've done medical marijuana, have said that the, any money that's left over in the program needs to go into the research and the use of cannabis. Now, I will tell you that Big Pharma's not in favor of that, and we can all surmise as to why. But I don't think, personally, the prohibition on marijuana has worked. I 
I don't. And that's where I agree. I mean, look at the trillions of dollars that we spend on preventing it, putting people in jail over the prosecutions on it. I mean, just think if we were doing that with alcohol. Do you think that a prohibition in today's world on alcohol would work? It wouldn't. Um, and that's, in, in my opinion, is number one, it should not be a schedule one. Number two, I would love to see a ton of research on it and the medicinal uses and other things that we can use on it. Um, we finally got hemp back where people can be using hemp products and growing hemp, and we're seeing positives out of that. Um, I don't think that marijuana has contributed to the moral decay of society. Cocaine, heroin, and some other things, I would agree that it's, it's not good for society. Yeah, thank you for the question and for the answers. Uh, another question in the back. Yes, from the cameraman. Uh, a quick question about state regulation and, or, yes, reg regulating and the alignment with the feds. And how you plan on addressing that and uh, or at least aligning with that? Well, we're kind of ignoring it. <laughs> I have a question for the audience. Oh, uh, how our state regulation will align with the feds and how do we bring that together? Well, it's illegal. It's, it, it's, it's going towards regulation for being legal with the states. It's illegal with the feds. Are you trying to work with them? I mean, is there any headway with working with, with federal agencies and with uh, uh, So we've kind of been watching what has happened in the other states. Basically, the federal government is turning its head. Now, there is an issue with banking. Uh, federally chartered banks, um, and I, I can't speak to that at great length, but you probably can on that. I know that credit unions have started to fill the void there a little bit because they don't have the same regulations. Um, if we sat back and waited for the federal government and everything, we'd be paralyzed at the state level. So I think that's where the states have just said, you know, we're gonna do our thing. Um, the feds have not really the bill that I've heard that is out there right now is kind of like take, kicking this back to the states. And just said, you states, you will make federalism. States' rights, you guys get to make your decisions. So we're not overly concerned. If it could, ETF could come in and kick in the door and get arrested, regardless of what the state says. So that's just, you know, something for to think about and where it will eventually go from there. I think ATF, I think they're too busy with DEA and ETF. I think they're too busy. With Actually, they don't have the funding, not to cut you off. Yeah. But the, so the, the congressional appropriations it bill. Is still, it is still illegal. It still is illegal. But the, but the, the congressional appropriations bill, which basically sets funding for the DEA, says that they cannot use any money, any federal money, to go after medical or recreational states. So that's basically been through um, through memos, through what's called the Ogden Memo, and every president has, since then, has reasserted that. Um, if there is a problem in a state, the state has to request the federal government to come in and investigate it. So, um, but because there's really no budget for it, um, I believe the Supreme Court necessarily hasn't ruled on it, but they have discussed it, saying that basically since the United States federal government is not enforcing the rules, that we would have pseudo-legalization in the United States already. And as Senator mentioned, there's bills out at the um, level right now. They've actually passed Congress twice. Um, they just haven't passed the Senate yet to remove the barriers for all states to move ahead with a program. Right, because ignoring is a very, very slippery slope, and that leads to no good place. So I just so. But you have to realize that California went medical in 96. Right. The, I can't remember the last time the federal government had conducted a raid. You know, I think it was like the early 2000s. And since that Ogden memo and that appropriations bill, that appropriations is very, very important. That's a big step for Congress to not allow the DEA to spend money to enforce marijuana laws. That was like one of the largest victories in cannabis activism that we've had. And that's very, very important. And that's one of the catalysts that is going to move the federal government to make this change. Oh, and hopefully it works out. I hope everybody is still both sides or uh is never good. If one thing is illegal and somebody else says they're ignoring, it, it, it's just never good unless everybody is aligned and looking at and going forward in the same direction. So uh, nobody likes to hear, well, you can, but I can't. And, yeah, let's um, get it straight. 
All right, thank you very much for the uh, questions. Uh, we have time for more, for more questions. A couple more questions. Uh, any more student questions? Perfect, here, here in the front. Uh, you said something about keeping farms and labs separate. Could you explain that? So one of the largest concerns is the growing and raising and processing of marijuana is very expensive. And inside of our bill, what we're trying to do is make sure that we don't get really large out-of-state corporations coming in and just having a vertical monopoly, that they control it from seed to dispense. We're trying to get it so that our licenses, in order to grow, process, dispense, at least one person has to be a Wisconsin state citizen. We would like to do a little bit more, but that just got shot down in a court case in another state where you have to require you know, just complete citizens. So our idea is that we don't want large commercial um, industrial vertical monopolies, that there's more opportunity for our state citizens and stakeholders to do the owning of it and the processing of it. And so the way Michigan first went legal was rather than have, uh, and this was 2008, we went medical. So rather than have any corporate cannabis, the way our cannabis distribution system was designed in Michigan was that of caregivers and patients. So your caregivers were allowed to grow, process cannabis to a limited amount of patients. So you had a, a, a plant count attached to each patient and then each caregiver could work with a certain amount of patients. And so what that did with Michigan, especially to help get a program going, is that it, it, it enabled hundreds of thousands of caregivers and patients to create a network in which they grew and distributed that marijuana to themselves. And that worked very, very well uh, for Michigan, especially because of the geographic nature, the way the demographics of Michigan is spread away out. It's very similar to Wisconsin. Large population hubs in some places, very rural in other places. So that caregiver patient network really allowed patients to work with an expert who grew their medicine for them, certain strains, made certain products for them, worked at price point. A lot of caregivers just uh, gave free medicine to their patients. So that type of system definitely helps avoid the corporate cannabis and the vertical integration that we see that comes along with a, a real regulatory licensing scheme. Thank you, and do we have time for more questions? Uh, Kevin. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions medically. So can people become chemically addicted to marijuana, and are the effects of marijuana similar to alcohol as far as impairment? Depends on who you ask. So that's, that's one of the things that research has not been clear about because, probably because of the Title I classification. So the majority of people that I ask say that um, medical cannabis is not addicting and it does not, it's not an entry level drug that takes you into other things. Now there are some people out there that say that it is. It's gonna be depending on the doctor or the professional that you talk to. And that's why I would really love that we have a little bit more research on it. So on the drug scale, cannabis is more similar to sugar and caffeine than it is to nicotine and alcohol. Cannabis is non-toxic, non-intoxifying. It does not attach itself to your brainstem. You cannot overdose. It has significantly less impairment than alcohol. Any other questions? Yes. question is about the combination of usage when people take alcohol combined with the marijuana. I, I don't really have anything. I, once again, I, we're not studying it. You know, I mean, I can tell you what I've seen in people if I've been out and about, but <laughs> I, I can't tell you any scientific... We'll call that anecdotal research. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't... 
that's one of, I think, the big problems is, is because it's a Schedule One drug, we're not seeing universities study it. We're not seeing the study on it. So I'm going to defer to Jay on that one. I don't know. Um, so that goes back to that public education campaign, is that we know alcohol is intoxicating and it does have some problems with it, uh, associated with it, especially with drug driving. So we would want to make sure people are aware. Uh, and it, again, this comes down to your, are, are, we in, are we endorsing and believing harm reduction? That is cannabis safer than alcohol. So if we do believe that, and we put dollars towards that and have a public education campaign that says that, a uh, part of that campaign would be don't use you know, THC products and alcohol together and or just like you have all these other adverse warnings on your over-the-counter medications or when you get a prescription from your pharmacy, um, they will talk about drug interactions. So, but because alcohol is widely used in Wisconsin and we have to look at Wisconsin as a whole, um, if legalization does come, I'm a big proponent of public education, is let's keep the tax low, let's use that tax for public education so that we can better our state. And that's where that would come in. You know, we have um, a Zoom call with a, or a medical doctor who actually is using cannabis regularly and very successfully to help people step off of opioids. And it's, and this is out of, he's out of Illinois, and it's his best treatment practice. So I, I know I'm throwing that in, it wasn't part of the question, but I just think you need to study this more and, and really realize all the use, uses that are out there that can be positive. And since California did go legal in 1996, and they've had smoking products since the get-go, and a lot of people can complain and say, oh, California's law is loose or was loose or whatever, I'm gonna point that back on the government and say, okay, you've had since 1996 to have California, which is, which is the eighth largest economy in the world, has legal marijuana there, and you're telling me that since 96, the federal government and or any university hasn't been able to go and set up shop there and study this this substance? That's why I go back to that microscope and that, that failed policy that if nobody's looking, no one is saying that this has failed. That, that clear evidence there that all of these states have had medical programs with access there, there should be no reason that there aren't studies done. And then on the side note, cannabis is the most studied substance there is out there. We have a whole publication of studies out there. And I don't know if you know the answer to this. How many studies does it take to get an FDA approval? No clue, but I know it takes years. One. I will tell you this. Um, I will tell you this though, a lot of the universities, they're not studying it because it puts their federal funding at risk. And they're afraid of the federal funding that comes down. That microscope of examining that. But if you want, there's a lot of other countries in the world that have studied cannabis where cannabis has been legal for a long time. And that's, the information that we do have has come from other countries that have done a deep dive. Abby? Okay, so I don't know if I'm going to work as well. Well, we talked about 62% of Wisconsinites agreeing with legalization. Are there percentages out there separating medical and recreational? And is our legislation actually mirroring that, or are we just trying to get somewhere? So, in all honesty, I'm going to get something passed. The bill that will come out, would that be the bill that I was write, that I would write if I was queen for a day? No. But I have to get it through two houses. There's 99 assembly people and there's 33 senators and they have to agree on what's coming through and then the governor has to say yes to it. So compromise is the issue here. We just recently did, well, for the election cycle, the Dems poll, we poll, everybody polls. What I found very interesting is it was a couple years ago, I don't know if it was 18 or 20, there was a lot of referendums coming out of the counties on the full legalization or medical. I found it very interesting um, that the northern part of the state had higher um, results on full legalization than even like Dane County, which I thought was pretty bizarre. Yeah. Um, right now, 54% of Wisconsinites across the board, Republicans and Democrats, are in favor of full legalization. 
when it comes to medical, it's up upwards of 80. It's like 80 or 85 across the board. Jason, you. Well, as we have these discussions about legalizing marijuana for uh, medical use and then potentially for adult use, um, past convictions for possession or use would still follow a lot of people from before these rules were passed. Is there any talk about expunging some of these records? So everything is a small process. Um, I am not, people want me to include that in the medical bill, and I don't want to mess up the medical bill by bringing in other issues to give people a reason to vote no on. So that's why it's not here. I do believe that if we get to adult use, that will also come. Yeah, it's more part of an adult use program than a medical program. You might see it part of a decriminalization program too, where you have a change in the state statute where a de decriminalization for a certain amount would come into play. You might see it's, it's some sort of expungement piece along with that also. But again, massaging that through the political process is really the hardest part. And probably expungement would be one of those things that would be left off the table in order to gain more support to pass a bill. That's the way I see it. I would concur. <laughs> yeah, we have time for one or two last questions. Scott. Uh, curious about the support from the Democrats. Like, do you have any co-sponsors, or is it just from your own party? So <laughs> when I first came out with this, um, I sat down with Melissa Agar. She was in the assembly. John Erpenbach was a sponsor in the Senate. And I said to them, please don't beat the hell out of me on this because I know it's not the bill that you want. And John's like, I totally get it. You gotta do what you can pass. So actually they were both very supportive of doing it. They did come out and say that it doesn't go far enough and everything. Um, if, if it was a Democratic controlled legislature, we would have full recreational. It's not. And So I don't know if the, last time we did have some of the Democrats sign on, but they're kind of going for the full recreational, full adult use. <laughs> we will get that down. Um, so I don't know if they'll sign on to it. Do they support it? They support moving the ball forward. And I think that's one of the things that I, I just want to emphasize. Every success is moving things in the right direction. And that's the one thing, it was the hardest thing for me to learn. I come out of the private sector. I've never served in public office before in my life. And I wanted to get something done, and I wanted it done, and I wanted it yesterday, no matter what the subject was. But that doesn't mean everybody thinks like you. So the goal is to, every session, move the ball forward. And I think that's what we're trying to do. And a lot of things, like even with hemp, my god, this guy didn't fall, did it? You know? So then we did a trailer bill on that. And I think there'll be other things that come out on it. So I think people are, people overall are afraid of change. And this is a very large change for our state. So if we can get something done, then the sky doesn't fall, maybe we can make another step. And adding the additional conditions and just things of that nature. Yeah, well, 100% of the, the Democrats that are elected right now and serving do support adult use legislation and do support medical marijuana also. Um, they know full well that if this bill passed that it will morph into something else in the future. There's not been one state that has just passed one bill, one legislation session and it solved all their medical marijuana problems and they never had to go back and deal with it again. So I think everybody's pretty fully aware of that, that this is a bill to start the program and this is not what the program will look like at the, at the end of the day. I saw a follow-up question. Yeah, I mean, like, if, if the disconnect is the adult use, but your bill would be a starting point, have those discussions taken place to say, this isn't what you want, but this is where we can go. Because clearly, if it's just a Republican bill, Evers isn't going to sign it because it's a Republican bill. I disagree. I think he'll sign the medical marijuana bill. So I. In when Governor Evers was first elected, I had sat down with him, and I'm working on things around dental therapy, health control costs, additional physicians in the state, medical marijuana, and he weighed in strongly, and he was like, how can I help you get this done? And I said, don't, don't talk about it to my 
<laughs> you know, just, just shh. Um, but I do firmly believe Governor Hughes will sign a medical bill. I'm a little bit different on that. That the political process and what happens before this bill passes will dictate whether that bill gets vetoed or not. We haven't seen the bill yet. We don't have any idea what the provisions are. We've heard some rumors and some talk and some things about it, but rubber hasn't hit the road yet. We haven't seen the bill. We haven't weighed the unintended consequences of the passing of this bill. We don't really know whether Governor Evers is gonna use it as a tool to veto it and send it back to the drawing board to put together another bill. Right now, the political landscape in Wisconsin is pretty unique and it's pretty hot. And there's no guarantee that anything is going to happen, including the passage of this bill that we're talking about. So I do want to weigh in on that a little bit. Yeah. I just want people to know, <coughs> politics has gotten uglier over the years because people have become hyper-partisan. But I never want you to forget that 95% of the legislation that comes out of Madison is bipartisan. You know, there are things that we're never going to agree on as parties, but we agree on a whole lot. So I disagree with you totally. I firmly believe Governor Evers will sign this. <clears throat> we have two final questions, uh, and uh, then we will wrap things up. Uh, the first question came over here, yes. Yeah, so we talked about Wisconsin and people in Wisconsin wondering if it, it's safe, where it's coming from, if it's laced with fentanyl and stuff like that. So the question I have is, do we need fentanyl tests in dispensaries? Do we make that mandatory? No, I would say no, just because of the standpoint that it's a controlled growing and it's going through the laboratories, and then the packaging on it and the processing is so controlled, and then the, um, you know, like the level of THC in it, and that's kind of the regulatory standpoint is that, you know, it's seed to sale, so we will know what seeds are bought, where they're planted, where they're grown, all the testing will be done, and then the packaging it will be controlled, and even our transporters. Um, so when we're transporting plants to the processing, to the dispensary, all those are going to be licensed, and the tracking is unbelievable on it. So my understanding is that the Drug Enforcement Administration DE office has not found any marijuana that has actually tested positive for fentanyl. That is a scare. It is not true. It is not happening. We do not have cannabis laced with fentanyl. At least the DEA has not shown us any positive results for offensive cannabis lace fentanyl. And Angie. Recreational states, when you have uh, regulation, what they're trying to do is remove the criminal aspect from marijuana use. So public usage would generally just become like a citation type thing or an ordinance violation or a simple fine. But because police have a limited amount of resources available, and I've been to cities, I've been to New York, I've been to places, it would be, again, impossible for our officers and a waste of their time to issue citations for everybody who is using marijuana in public. I think the best way to do that would maybe be again, through a public education campaign. Again, marijuana is legal now. Respect your neighbors. Don't blow fat smoke in your face. You know, that type of stuff. Um, I did see one more hand. Caitlin. Yeah, um, so let's say hypothetically we do get to a point where marijuana is legal and Marijuana 
the question is about uh, adult use marijuana and, uh, and impaired driving. So definitely you're, you're going to have some sort of regulatory body in place. That's one of the reasons, again, that the discussion sometimes slow down is that the science behind it, we don't have a empirical blood level like we do with alcohol that proves intoxication or doesn't improve intoxication. Another issue with cannabis is, is that the metabolites that stay in your system, which is what like the science would test for to see if you had been using those, those stay in your system for a long time after usage. So it is, you know, the, the testing that we have available right now um, is, is not as similar as what we have for alcohol testing. Um, I wish Sheriff Schmidt was here because he would definitely answer this question. The one thing that we do have is we have drug recognition experts in Wisconsin, and right now marijuana is part of their training that they have. Um, so when our offices are out in the field and they and, you know, uh, suspect impairment of some way, shape, or form, they're trained to recognize these things, and that's one of the things they talk about is the marijuana impairment. Again, once legalization comes, that public education campaign that I keep mentioning is gonna be very, very important because that's how we're gonna teach people not to use marijuana immediately and get in their car and drive. Normal in the agencies that I work with, we kind of have a guidance that we've put out to people, especially in legal states, you know, like I mentioned, don't smoke in front of your kids, don't smoke in your home, those types of things, you know, common sense type stuff that you would think. Um, and one of those is, again, do not drive or operate heavy machinery uh, after seven to, you know, wait seven or eight hours after inhalation um, of the marijuana before you operate those types of things. So again, I think common sense goes a long ways, but again, the, the from what I've learned in the past, especially with like anti-smoking campaigns and anti-alcohol campaigns, that the dollars that our government spends on that public education ends up saving us money in the long run with those societal costs that we've mentioned. So we were told, um, and I'm gonna say it's about four years ago, that DOJ actually was giving out grants, and they had, and I wanna say it was Sheboygan or Manitowoc, where there is a new breathalyzer where they can actually test for the level of THC. And that that was very, very new technology, um, but that it was like growing technology as more and more states have gone to adult use. So I, that was at least four years ago when we had those conversations. So I, I do wish the sheriff was here because he would be able to fill you in a little bit more on that. Um, and, and I am sure technology comes about as demand increases. So I think as there is demand, and then I'm, this is again, I would love to be able to have more studies on this. What level of THC in your system, you know, just like we do at alcohol at 0.08, there, somebody's gonna at some point come up with whatever, or however you measure it, I have absolutely no idea, with what should be, if you're under that number, you are still functioning, you can still drive or whatever, just like we do with alcohol, and then the testing will at some point be there. All right, uh, we are about 75 minutes into this, and we normally end at this point, and we should uh, follow this today as well. I want to thank you for your questions uh, very much, for your coming tonight, and uh, let's thank our panelists, Senator Papowski and Jay. <laughs>